the headlines. Kaduna State Governor Sani condemns seminarians killing, vows to track down culprits. Victim of kidney harvest in just narrates ordeal. As United Nigeria aircraft with 51 passengers overshoots runway amid heavy rain at Lagos Airport. And from the international scene, at least 296 people killed after powerful magnitude 7 earthquake strike Morocco. Hello and welcome to Trust TV News Update. I am Sumaya Boubakar. Thank you for joining us and now the news in details. The Kaduna State's governor, Ubasani, has condemned the killing of a seminarian during a bandit attack at the St. Raphael Catholic Church Parish in the Zangon Katov local government area of the state. The bandits on Thursday night burnt down the church, killing the seminarian Stephen Nlami in a process. While expressing anger over the attack, Governor Sani, in a statement issued by his Chief Press Secretary, Mohammed Shehu, vowed to track down the perpetrators of the crime and ensure that they face the lawful or full rot of the law. The attack, the governor said, was carried out with the sole intention of igniting ethnic and religious tensions in Kaduna State and sabotaging the government's effort towards rebuilding trust in the communities. The governor urged security agencies to swiftly investigate the incident and ensure that the culprits are arrested and made to face the full wrath of the law. He also expressed his heartfelt condolences to the families of the victims and assured them of the state government's support during this difficult time. Meanwhile, the chairman, Christian Association of Nigeria in Kaduna State, Reverend Joseph Hayab, while addressing a news conference, urges governments at all levels to ensure the security of lives and properties in the area. This is another sad reality we are facing. We have been hoping that we've gone <clears throat> past this issue of kidnapping and killings in Kaduna. But what happened yesterday in Parliament come on to further prove that we have not yet started. It should be told that in the last one month, if not two months, different kidnapping experiences have been going on around Kaduna, in Zaria, Usasa, and others. But as I speak a few days ago somewhere, I said, we have become tired of every day crying that our members have been kidnapped, crying that our family members, people have been kidnapped, crying that this evil is happening. In the meantime, the Kaduna State Police Command says it has launched a manhunt for the attackers of the St. Raphael Catholic Church Parish in Zangon Katov, local government area of the state. According to the spokesman for the Kaduna State Police Command, ASP Manir Hassan, bandits stormed the church in droves. Hassan stated that the, when the terrorists could not gain access to the main building, they set the house ablaze alongside a vehicle and motorcycle packed on the premises. He explained that Lalami died from the smoke he inhaled while trying to escape from the raging fire, while two other priests inside the parish house were able to escape from the raging fire. The police public relations officer said the command had launched an investigation to ascertain what led to the church attack with a view to arresting the perpetrators and bringing them to justice. Now, moving away from Kaduna, the River State's Police Command says a manhunt has been launched to fish out the killers of the divisional police officer of Ahuada in Ahuada East local government area of River State, SP Bago Agbashim. The officer was ambushed, killed, and his body decapitated by cultists suspected to be members of the deadly Icelanders called group in Ahuada Axis of River State Friday night when the deceased led his team to the hideout of some criminal gangs operating at Odumude.
A statement issued in Port Harcourt on Saturday by the command's public relation officer, SP Grace Iringe Koko, said the commissioner of the police, Polycap Nwaonyi has ordered an investigation into the circumstances surrounding the death of the police officer. SP Koko said Bago Agbashim displayed exemplary courage during a mission to combat criminal activities in the Odumode area of Ahuada East Local Government Area of River State. Okay, De Kamal, the woman whose kidney was allegedly removed by one Dr. Noah Kekere of Morina Clinic and Maternity Hospital in Jos on Friday, has explained how a doctor discovered her kidney was removed. The victim told Trust TV that her kidney was discovered discovered missing following a complaint to a doctor in the Joss University Teaching Hospital about persistent abdominal pain that she had been exercising and then that she was thoroughly examined and confirmed that her kidney was removed. Ado Musa completes the report. This is Muruna Clinic of Maternity located at Enshanu community of Jostno local government area of the state where an appendix operation was said to have been carried out on Kende in January 2018 by Dr. Kereke. The family of the victim said the doctor had originally told them that an appendix was discovered on Kende which needed urgent operation, alleging that, and unto them, the doctor removed Kende's right kidney during the operation. On Wednesday, the husband of the victim, Bushari Kamal, accused Dr. Kereke of removing his wife's kidney. Effort to get the reaction of the accused doctor who is currently in the police custody we are unsuccessful. But the spokesperson of the state police command, DSP Alabo Alfred, says they are investigating the matter. Mrs. Kende explains how a doctor discovered her kidney was removed. The time when the doctor moved the appendix, he showed me, I said, Kai, don't give me a gesture. I don't know that time. I might show my husband. Okay, so. Do my time that he. Sandra, I can't stand up sit down. You can ask me, say, you can tell me, say, talk, madam, don't move your one kitty. Man, kitty, man, I don't know, if let me go and ask my husband. I come up for that hospital, I just to come. I can't call my husband for phone, say, talk. I don't come up for hospital. I man, they tell me, say, my husband, I say, talk, tell me, doctor, come out to the appendix. You show, you say, you show, I'm talk. I met the time say doctor come out something for my stomach. What in come out say the thing come out uh, appendix? Appendix in come out uh, kidney. Kidney? Ah, so talk. Do a doctor tell me that. Can the father explains that she was never in her lifetime admitted in a hospital or underwent surgery until 2018 when she was first operated by Dr. Kereke. As far as born, now for due to her born now, I, I, I go on Sunday, I come out on Monday. The second daughter my brother for us are born. The third one, the day my go and speak to Fabana, that day I will come out. The husband of the victim, Kamal Bushari, while reacting to the incident, called on security agencies to ensure justice for his wife. Well, since five days ago, I couldn't sleep up to right, right now, and I could not even eat anything. So what I want now is I just want the, the relevant authority to, 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 to do the justice on this matter. Hundreds of teenagers across the globe were enticed and exploited to sell their organs, especially the kidney. But the case of Kendi is quite different in the sense that neither she nor the husband was informed that her kidney would be removed. And that is why the husband is appealing to relevant authority to come to their aid and ensure that justice is done for his wife. From Josh Adomusa reporting for Trust TV. Nigeria's lack of stable running water and inadequate toilet facilities is a major contributing factor to poor hygiene, which indirectly exposes women to sexual abuse while using unsecure spaces like bushes for convenience. In this report, Chairman Dabeng explores the connection between poor hygiene practices and gender-based violence. The report. 
one of such crimes perpetrated against Nigerians in vulnerable states is that of sexual gender-based violence, SGBV. Sexual gender-based violence has remained a menace to the Nigerian society, showing very little signs of slowing down. Experts believe it can be traced to poor toilet facilities and inadequate attention to water sanitation and hygiene, otherwise known as WASH. You know, people are talking about infrastructures. Now, some of the infrastructures they are using in the public places are not in tune with the present day realities. How do we come up with infrastructure that we speak, you know, to best global realities, you know, in recent times? So those are part of the things, you know, that we have been talking about, you know, advocating, talking to different stakeholders, then enlightening public about how they can keep the environment clean. You know, again, about how, you know, we can mitigate the issue of SGBV. The United Nations Population Fund says one in three women will have experienced gender-based violence by the age of 15 and are stigmatized by the society despite being victims. On the flip side, some women are perpetrators of SGBV, but there is very little information to show the prevalence of the menace against men, which indicates the society has ignored the plight of men who are being abused. So, uh, rape is something that we have to find against everybody. Whether you are a man or a woman, whether you are a girl or a boy. So, and that's exactly why we are putting our sensation there, then encouraging victims to speak up. The act of shaming victims of SGBV is an act which must come to a permanent end to encourage victims of both genders to speak up. Legal processes must also ensure justice for victims, while the judiciary must instill harsher punishments that will deter perpetrators. Traditional and religious leaders also have a role to play. For the traditional, if it weren't or still having a little bit of that little traditional call to serve as deterrent to this kind of menace, who might have to invoke the gods because uh, these creatures were bound to be respected. They should be respected because God did not create us for abuse. Stakeholders agree that parents need to be more involved in the lives of their children to provide guidance in order to curtail the menace of SGBV in Nigeria. Chamun Dabeng, Trust TV News, Abuja. An aircraft belonging to United Nigeria Airlines operating from Oweri to Lagos on Friday evening overshot the runway at the Murichala Mohammed International Airport, the MMIA Lagos, with about 200 meters. The incident happened at about 7.35 p.m. on runway L18 during a heavy downpour. The rescue operations began immediately with the arrival of officials from Aerodrome Rescue and Firefighting Service, the ARFFS of the Federal Airport Authority, Authority of Nigeria, the FAN. The aircraft, which was coming in from the Sam Mbakwe International Cargo Airport, Oweri, operated and landed normally, but skidded off the runway upon landing. In their official statement issued on Friday and signed by the United Nigeria Airlines Head Corporate Communications, Achilles Chud Uchegu said all passengers were safely evacuated alongside their luggage. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, this can only be God. God did it. God did this. God did this. Madam, please, just say for your name. You're watching news update on Trust TV. Coming up. We'll take a look at Regasa residents to cry poor health center. This and more after the break. Stay with us. But, but as an elder, a most prominent son of the area, yes. were you able to intervene to, to help sort out the problem? Yes. So you are detained because of the riot without knowing what it was all about? Exactly. Mm. I was just framed up. And how did it happen? Trust TV presents a riveting exclusive interview with General Zamani Lekwot. In the comfort of his home in Kaduna, the retired general went over his long life and recalled the tragic events that led to loss of hundreds of lives in his hometown, Zangun Kataf, in May 1992. There was nothing connected with me about a market riot. Mm. I have no shop there. Mm. I don't live in the town. Mm. They don't know me. 
people who did it wanted to hide the truth. Mm. Either to blackmail me or to placate me for what reasons only they know. Mm. Revealing his side of the story, General Lequot said he was framed, tried, convicted and pardoned for a crime he did not commit in the first place. When Babangida government saw that there was no case in the case, decree number 55 of 1973 mm. was enacted, mm. directing the tribunal to send all their proceedings to Abuja, barring us from appealing. Then the hostility of Justice Okadibo, who appeared to be a hired agent, mm. because he violated the legal proceedings in court. He was supposed to be a high court judge. Mm. It is all in reminiscences next Saturday, September 9th at 8 p.m. with the repeat on Thursday, September 14th at 10 p.m. only on your trusted television channel. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is News Update on Trust TV. Here is a recap of our top stories. We brought you that, I beg your pardon on that one. We brought you Kaduna State Governor Sani condemns seminarians killing and vows to track down culprits and victim of kidney harvest and just narrates ordeal. Now moving on to more stories, agriculture, if Africa is, if well, you know, harnessed, has the potential to solve the continent food security challenges. Now in this report, Yusuf Akogu examines how African countries can leverage cross-border cooperation to provide food for its growing hungry population. The report. Agriculture in Nigeria was relegated to the background where crude oil was discovered in the late 50s. This negligence over the years has resulted in huge food insecurity being experienced in recent times. Experts are of the view that with the government's renewed commitment to security, Nigeria can maximize its potential in agriculture value chain through collaboration in Africa. For a long time, Nigeria has been dependent on oil. And uh, that has caused a lot of problems, you know, inflation and, 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 and the rest. So if... Um, Nigeria would develop its agricultural sector, I don't think that oil will even be relevant. You have the potential to develop to feed Africa and the rest of the world. We have um, um, a purely natural environment. In other words, um, we're able to produce organic um, um, rice. And then we also, uh, and the taste of our rice is fresh and it's, it's nicer than what even comes from Europe. And uh, right now in Ghana, people enjoy locally produced rice, even more than what is brought from outside. And I believe that if we're able to produce it in quantity, it will easily displace what is brought from outside. But how prepared is Nigeria for former cross-border business deals using the instrument of African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement that will propel industrialization along the agricultural value chain? No country can be industrialized fully without a uh, source of raw materials. And uh, most of uh, the inputs uh, and uh, the, the requirements for producing finished goods are in agriculture, uh, sometimes directly and sometimes through multiple stages of processing. And therefore, this will directly impact agri uh, uh, industrial growth. Analysts believe that leveraging agriculture value chain will boost trade volumes and values among countries in Africa. Yusuf Akogu, Trust Television News, Abuja. The dilapidated state of the primary health care at Rigasa community in Igabi local government area in Kaduna state is worsening lack of access to quality health care services to residents in the area. The residents are worried about the lack of drugs and functional uh, health care facilities needed for effective health care delivery to the community. Trust Davis Bellamusa visited the health facility and sent in this report. Rigasa is a community with a sizable population in Kaduna State. This primary health center is one of the few health facilities that people rely on for medical attention, but it is in a sorry state now due to unhygienic environment 
and poor facility. According to the resident, the condition of the health facilities has become a source of concern for families and pregnant women and children in the community now find it difficult to access medical attention. There is no decent restroom and a place to look after the sick. The hospital is no longer a health facility because it is in a dilapidated state. The hospital needs attention from the government. When in labor, the women in the community suffer as they only go to the general hospital in Rigasa or to private health facilities to deliver their babies no matter how urgent the cases are. The residents are appealing to the local government to come to their aid as the facility is under the local government. We want the government to employ more workers, stock more prescriptions, drugs, and provide the necessary facilities. In fact, the hospital cannot cater for the needs of our population. We are calling on the government to come to our aid and renovate the hospital because it is the health facility that is close to us. This will enable us to rush our children, pregnant women and the aged to the facility in case of an emergency. We need more beds in the hospital and more qualified workers. Effort to reach the chairman of Igabi local government were futile. Bella Musa, Cross TV News Kaduna. From the international scene, 6.8 magnitude earthquake has hit Morocco, killing at least 630 people, injuring more than 320 people, damaging buildings and sending terrified uh, residents fleeing their homes into the streets for safety. Now, Morocco State Television reported the doubling of the death toll Saturday morning from overnight, citing the Ministry of the Interior of those injured. 51 were in a critical condition. The residents of Marrakesh, the nearest big city of the epicenter, said some buildings collapsed in the old city, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The earthquake hit shortly after 11 p.m. local time, about 2200 GMT on Friday evening, according to the United States Geological Survey, the USGS. Journalist Nouradine Bazin from Marrakesh described the situation as a horrific night. Local media reported roads leading to the mountain region around the epicenter were jammed with vehicles and blocked with collapsed rocks, slowing rescue efforts. The African Union, AU, has become a permanent member of the G20, also called Group of 20. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi made the announcement Saturday as he inaugurated a leaders' summit in New Delhi, the capital city of India, for the world's wealthiest nation. During his opening speech, Modi invited the chairman of the African Union, Azali Asomani, to take his seat as a permanent member of the group. Prior to the summit, the G20 was a forum comprising 19 countries, including the European Union. The group of 20 worlds works to address major issues related to the global economy, such as international financial stability, climate change mitigation and sustainable development. 
Nigerian President Bola Tinubu departed the country for India on Tuesday ahead of the summit. And in sport, Super Eagles winger Samuel Kalu has joined Swiss club Laz Lausanne Sport from Watford as a season-long loan deal. The loan deal also included a purchase option. And Kalu will wear jersey number 22 at his new club. The 26-year-old joined Watford from League One club Jehonda Bordwe in January 2022. The Nigerian has, however, struggled with injuries and managed just 13 league appearances for the Hornets. Now, Kalu is expected in Switzerland once he gets his visa. He previously played in Slovakia for as for as Trencia and Belgian Pro League club, the Cargent. And with that, we wrap up news updates on Trust TV. Do not forget to follow us across all our social media platforms and you can join our YouTube live for more news programs and documentaries. I am Sumaya Abubakar. Thanks for watching.